Perfect. So we will get started up and uh, we'll give it one more minute and we will get started. Just a couple um, pieces as we're having conversation today and um, questions start to arise, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, Colleen will help us keep track of uh, the questions. Um, we will have time mm -hmm. at the very end um, to uh, ask our panelists uh, questions. Um, so feel free to think about some of those questions as, as we're going through. So, um, and if you guys wanna introduce yourselves in the chat um, as well, um, feel free uh, just so we all know who, who is here with us today. So, um, you know, we are getting ready for that. Hope you all have your lunch ready um, as you guys are listening in. Um, our panelists, fortunately, they won't be able to have their lunch just because they will be um, speaking with y'all in a few minutes, but um, very excited to have uh, many of them here today with us. So um, to just get us started, uh, my name is Danny Robles. Uh, I am the Chicago Energy Policy Coordinator here with the Illinois Environmental Council. And in this role, I've uh, had the pleasure to begin talking about the intersection of decarbonization in the transportation space and have been very fortunate to learn a lot about this work from many of today's advocates um, and what the work that they've done to get us where we're at today. And, um, I'm excited to have them here with us to talk to the environmental community so we can be uh, better um, advocates uh, with the transportation agencies uh, to make sure that they're developing environmental conscious um, long term plans. Um, and this is pretty crucial to us right now because, um, as many of us know, IPC, the IPCC had just published a very concerning report um, for earlier this year um, calling for humanity on a code red to move to reducing carbon emission as soon as possible. Um, you know, we are getting close to the precipice um, and there's a lot of movement uh, in, in our country from Congress uh, and the Senate passing a $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill here specifically in Illinois, we're all on pins and needles. Um, some of us are doing double duty and checking what's happening at the General Assembly because um, there is a uh, Clean Climate and uh, Equitable Jobs Act that is uh, just close to being over the finish line. Um, and there's also been a lot of movement here in the state of Illinois on, um, on um, legislation that will help uh, transportation agencies make uh, greenhouse emissions part of their priority. So we're very excited to have this conversation today. Um, So, um, and one of the reasons why we're super excited to have this conversation today is because as this uh, movement is happening, you know, one of, one of the strengths of the environmental community is that we are working uh, with a united voice on a lot of uh, issues and priorities, and Illinois Environmental Council has been on the forefront of helping that uh, since our founding in 1975 uh, by a group of dedicated grassroots environmentalists. IC has led uh, issue advocacy campaigns by allowing environmental organizations to pull their resources and create a higher profile on environmental issues. Um, and today, IEC represents over 100 different environmental groups and community organizations, and including 500 individual members. And a lot of the work that is happening um, today um, down in Springfield is because of this work that um, our United Front has been able to achieve. And with so many uh, organizations fighting alongside, we're actually very excited to increase our capacity um, to be able to fight for these policies, both here in Chicago City Hall and with our Illinois federal uh, delegation uh, to help bring um, clean energy and transportation, um, protect our natural resources um, and our natural lands and um, bring clean air and water to our communities and fight alongside some of our environmental justice communities to ensure that um, there's prosperity here in Illinois. So let us jump into what you can expect from today's Lunch and Learn. Um, so today we will give a recap of the federal bipartisan infrastructure bill and what Illinois can expect Fact, uh, as for the allocation process um, and which agencies will receive some of these funds, um, as well as some of the potential items coming from the budget reconciliation package. 
Uh, we will also talk a bit about the state energy bill um, that is currently being debated in um, the Senate um, in the General Assembly and what um, what what uh, implications that will have. Um, and we'll have a deeper conversation on the Illinois Department of Transportation, RTA, and the recently signed uh, HB 253 that will mandate transportation agencies to develop asset management plans with performance-based metrics for their upcoming um, uh, processes. And we will also have a special guest today who will give us insight on what's happening in uh, local municipality, uh, Normal Illinois, um, and how we can learn from their planning processes. And uh, we'll wrap it up with uh, what's happening in other states, um, some, some other priorities that uh, other states are implementing, and how we can possibly bring that here to Illinois. And um, we'll leave some time at the very end for questions and make sure that we'll direct those to our panelists. So let us meet our panelists. So today um, with us, we have Jackie Grimshaw, who is the Vice President of Government Affairs at the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Um, Jackie has a wealth of knowledge and experience in the transportation advocacy space, um, having, been, having grown CNT's work in this space since the 90s. Her work is tailored to bringing reform and advocacy to expand transit access um, across Chicagoland and bring better air quality in the region. Um, alongside uh, Jackie, we'll also have Tom Cataract, um, or TK, who is the Senior Vice President of Transportation and Infrastructure with uh, the Civic Committee for, of the Commercial Club of Chicago. Um, uh, TK collaborates with members from the Civic Committee to bring advocacy and awareness to uh, bring sustainability, uh, innovation, and create better governance for the agencies working on transportation here in our state of Illinois. Um, also on our panel today, um, we have Audrey Winnick uh, from um, the Metropolitan Planning Council. She is the Director of Transportation, and Audrey's work with MPC has led her to research and advocate for sustainable funding uh, for transportation in Illinois, improving accessibility for folks with disabilities to our transportation systems, and also mitigating the mobility barriers for folks in underserved committees. And our special guest today is Mayor Chris Coos of Normal Illinois. Um, through uh, Mayor Coos's leadership, the town of Normal Illinois has been developing comprehensive land use plans with complete and connected developments that promote reduction of the need of cars um, in uh, municipality. Um, and the city's plan has actually received the Daniel Burnham Award uh, for planning um, from the Illinois chapter of American Planning Association. So we're gonna learn a lot from what uh, he has done. So that is where we're at with this presentation. And I'm gonna turn it over to um, our friend, Jackie Grimshaw, who will get us started a little bit on uh, the federal uh, infrastructure package. So Jackie, you are clear to take it away. Jackie, if you're talking, we're going to have to unmute you, by the way. Um, after a year and a half of Zoom, I would know how to unmute myself to get started. But, um, you know, <laughs> we it is what, what it is. So, uh, so thank you for the invitation to be here today. And, um, you know, the the Congress has been busy um, deciding on what should happen with our reauthorization. So currently uh, we have funding under the FAST Act, uh, which is due to re be reauthorized this year. The Transportation Infrastructure Committee did do a, um, a reauthorization package, uh, which was called the INVEST Act uh, that they sent over to the Senate. Uh, and instead of the usual process for a reauthorization of federal transit funding. Uh, we had this bipartisan committee uh, and the bipartisan committee came up with this infrastructure investment act that uh, does that, that change what came over from the house to this new package of, of, of funding. Um, 
the 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 bill has now gone back to the to the house for concurrence and uh, the transportation infrastructure committee um as they re reconvene in washington this week will decide on whether or not they concur with this package uh now the the politics behind this is that the white house is in favor of the bipartisan uh bipartisan uh infrastructure bill and whether or not the house will um will uh, I guess disregard um, the the White House preferences or how they will uh, concur is uh, what we will be watching to see. But um, you know the 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 bottom line is that the bipartisan bill has provided probably more funding for transportation infrastructure than we've ever had. Um, you know in terms of obviously since uh, we 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 had the highway um the federal highway uh program uh that built the interstate system you know back in uh, the 50s uh we um and and the just the value of dollars have changed considerably so uh the dollar amount but also you know the percentage of money going for transportation infrastructure is uh is something that we've never seen before. So, um, you know, currently when we look at uh, how the, the the FAST Act was distributed, you know, we had federal, we had pockets of funds uh, that came in that uh, were part of um, different buckets. So there was funding that came in for highways and funding that came in for transit that went that uh is uh, uh sub allocated to the the rta now um the fast act uh, or at least this bipartisan infrastructure bill does not do the same kind of of funding so whether or not we'll have um uh, the the same uh the same buckets like um the surface transportation block grant program which was uh funding for for highways that that was flexible that could be flexed over to transit, whether or not we'll continue to have the transportation alternatives uh, program the way it's currently funded, uh, the congestion mitigation and air quality uh, bucket of funds, which was to uh, try and improve our air quality, uh, the National Highway Freight Program, the Highway Safety Improvement Program, the National Highway Performance Program are all in the FAST Act and, and how much of that is retained in the bipartisan uh, and, and in the reconciliation we have, we're yet to see. On the transit side, you know, there is a bucket of funds for state of good repair, um, bucket of funds, a grant program for bus and bus facilities, uh, funding for capital uh, investment, uh, new investments like new starts and small starts, as well as core capacity. Uh, and um, then we also had the bus and rail uh, facilities discretionary program uh, and the low emissions vehicle program. Now, one thing that we know is that, you know, the, the bipartisan uh, uh, package in, included an increased amount of money for uh, low emissions uh, and electric vehicles which will get to part of the air quality improvement that we support through IEC. Uh, and there was also in the FAST Act, the Transit Oriented Development Pilot Program. Um, and that's a program that seems to be in danger from the bipartisan bill. Uh, and then uh, the thing that uh, we were just talking about with Mayor Coos, the, the positive train control grant program that allowed the Metro, for example, to implement a positive train control. And then uh, finally, there was a bucket of money for safety programs. Um, so, you know, those are some of the, the programs that uh, existed in the FAST Act that were part of the INVEST Act. And some of them are uh, to continue to be included in the bipartisan bill. But, um, you know, we are yet to see what really comes out of that. So uh, I'll leave it there and wait for your questions. Thank you, Jackie. Yes, um, 
if you guys have any questions for Jackie, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will make sure to get them um, over during our Q&A portion of the conversation. But Jackie, thank you so much for that wonderful breakdown on the federal funds coming in. Um, and I will turn this over to um, talk a little bit about um, uh, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, SB 2408, that um, a few of our folks are currently um, listening in on. Um, a lot of work has gone into this over the last uh, few years, and we're uh, just over the finish line or just at the finish line. So very excited to see where this is um, coming in because uh, this would put um, Illinois um, as one of the nation leaders in setting the tone for a carbon-free future by phasing out fossil fuels from the energy sector by 2045. Um, and with that, there is some provisions on transportation that are very crucial for us um, in the leading months to make sure that we have greenhouse reductions. Um, some of these um, to help decrease the dependence uh, will include uh, you know, 1 million uh, electric vehicles by 2030 here in um, Illinois. It's a commitment that Governor Pritzker has been pushing for. Uh, with, with that, um, he also wants to create um, Illinois as a uh, nation leader in manufacturing, um, so promoting uh, building and manufacture EV vehicles here, um, economic development through infrastructure, um, pieces and development, um, investment in low income and environmental justice communities and improve uh, electric utilities. So to dive a little deeper into what um, these provisions talk about, um, the first one uh, would mandate um, the Illinois uh, Commerce Commission. I see uh, one of uh, their state attorneys here. Um, they, they, they would begin uh, building up a process uh, for stakeholders to evaluate um, the cost effectiveness and achievement of equity goals in transportation electrification investments, um, which, which uh, would help uh, understand the grid process um, and what it would be required to make sure that electrification becomes uh, accessible here in the state of Illinois. Um, it also would require uh, the two major utility uh, companies, uh, Comet and Ameren, to develop uh, beneficial electrification plans by July 2022. Um, so uh, a few things to look into that would be uh, uh, looking at the electrification of transportation systems, um, both public and private um, sectors, uh, participation of residents in uh, and communities, so making sure that they are engaging uh, people across the state in how they're developing these uh, guidelines. Um, and there's also uh, uh, priority inequity, so making sure that there are, are provisions to invest 40% of the funds to environmental justice communities or low income eligible communities. Um, there's also a requirement to invest 5% uh, of their uh, funding towards uh, medium duty and uh, heavy duty vehicle infrastructure um, and ethics provisions that would uh, require them to have equitable hiring practices. Um, other pieces that would help move things along um, within the electrical vehicle would be um, offering rebates for electrical uh, charging uh, infrastructure, especially those located in eligible communities and uh, making sure that um, as we're uh, making these construction projects uh, available that there is a prevailing wage to these projects to make sure that folks who are um, building these uh, infrastructures have uh, a good uh, sustainable job. Um, in, in another rebate that would be part of this would be uh, a $4,000 rebate in purchasing a new vehicle that uh, would be um, facilitated through the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency um, to ensure that um, that that is uh, available for folks as we are building out these uh, electrical vehicles. Um, the IEPA would also be uh, required to create a uh, position for electric vehicle coordinator uh, to make sure that um, they oversee all the policies and projects that are being delegated to them. And uh, the final piece would be uh, for the Illinois Department of Transportation to conduct a study uh, to uh, figure out the proliferation um, of how these um, projects would uh, impact uh, either negatively or positively the transportation infrastructure. Um, and that would be required to be submitted by 
uh, September 2022. Um, but um, as we know, um, greenhouse emissions, uh, electrical vehicles are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we uh, can't just rely on electrical vehicles to be the only solution to bring down uh, greenhouse emissions. There are so many other things that need to be uh, prioritized as well to ensure that um, we all have uh, a great place to live and uh, air quality that is dependent, but also safe streets that make it easier for people to um, have access to uh, places that they need to go, shorter trips, um, and um, uh, planning processes that will help us uh, get those shorter trips available. So with nearly half of all car trips just three miles or less, um, reducing vehicle mile travel is uh, a very easy uh, solution that uh, could be uh, advocated for, and that would come down to careful planning to make sure that walking, biking, and transit are options that are available. Um, and th th this would also help um, many other pieces, um, including uh, reducing the urban heat island effect by making sure that we have um, less of these streets um, available for cars and more for um, um, walking, biking access, uh, making sure that uh, we are protecting our natural land as well by uh, reducing natural uh, sprawl uh, of uh, the urban and suburban areas um, and making sure we're investing in uh, green solutions to bring uh, some of that natural land back to our areas who have already um, sprawled out. Um, so um, what what this does to, uh, to help reduce uh, driving, it it creates uh, improvements on vehicle efficiency and vehicle electrifications um, are things that the federal policy are pushing forward um, to create more um, uh, cars and spend more money on our roadways. But us and the environmental community uh, can do more by uh, promoting um, reducing uh, driving, um, which at the end of the day will lead to more emissions reduction um, and hopefully reduce congestion because um, as we know, electrical vehicles will only create more uh, vehicles on the road and could create, uh, continue creating um, issues of safety um, for our communities. And um, yes, um, the, the current uh, uh, SB 2408 um, does not have those uh, provisions available, but those are things that we can uh, advocate for in future uh, policies and um, legislation. So um, it's one of the reasons why we're having this conversation um, to uh, talk through how we can have that impact at, at different uh, agencies. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the reason why we continue having this is because a lot of a lot of the money that has been uh, proposed by the federal government was going towards um, expanding some um, highways and it creates deeper um, issues of congestion. So um, we can uh, prevent that by making sure that um, we are advocating for these pieces in uh, the upcoming um, plans, capital plans that both IDOT and RTA are going to be putting. And um, in one second, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Cataract, who can give us a little bit more insight on how um, some of these transportation agencies are looking at budget allocation and uh, give us a little bit of insight on how we can uh, be better advocates um, as they're developing um, some performance-based metrics. Thanks, Danny. Um, I'll say sort of three main points. Uh, first, I'd like to leave you with the fact that the state and particularly IDOT is the most important agency when it comes to transportation. Uh, there is very little that can be funded or built in the state without the Illinois Department of Transportation, IDOT's engagement. And on your sort of imminent success in reforming energy policy, I would argue that your um, focus in the future is as deserving to, to be put toward transportation as the number one, you know, sector in emitting greenhouse gases, uh, this is where the next ball game is. And so um, that's the first point. The second is that the time for reform and change is unlike any other. You know, Jackie alluded to this on the federal transportation bill, but the same is true 
in Illinois. We have a historic capital bill. We doubled the gas tax, indexed it to inflation, raised other fees. It's, um, it's gonna produce $33.5 billion for transportation over six years. And that's not including what might come on top of uh, from the federal government in this new pending bill in Congress. And we have a strong and diverse coalition to build upon that really worked together over the last year or two on some important reforms at IDOT. And that coalition uh, had the Illinois Environmental Council and you know, the green groups behind it, as, as well as business, community-based groups, labor, and local elected officials, uh, like the mayors and Mayor Chris Coos that's here. It's a very powerful coalition. And I think we had some success and we should build on it. Uh, some of those successes, uh, we really made equity a much higher priority at the Illinois Department of Transportation. The IEC was a leader in getting over 50 members of the General Assembly to ask IDOT to make IDOT or equity a top priority in their programs. Uh, and that was a letter that was led by the speaker, uh, Chris Welch. And that's resonating there. That doesn't happen without IEC in this coalition. Uh, there's an effort uh, to reform transit in Northeastern Illinois that's ongoing, that IEC has been a key partner with. Um, and the key uh, reform and change here is what's on the slide deck is this new bill to, imp uh, to implement performance-based programming at the Illinois Department of Transportation. It's a, a wonky technical term to really mean, you know, how does the state choose what to build and how are they putting their money toward projects? For Decades. This is a fairly black box process. You know, we're um, we're fortunate enough to know what IDOT uh, wants to invest in and how much, but until today, we really didn't know why or how or what goals they were trying to achieve. Uh, that changes, and and this is a real time effort that's happening. Uh, just Friday, the slide that you're looking at, the state released uh, their new tool on how to choose what big projects they're going to invest in and what types of criteria they're gonna use. Uh, that is happening because of a law, HB 253, that the coalition I mentioned uh, has been pushing for over two years and was signed by J.B. Pritzker uh, earlier in August. And so the third point is sort of, you know, where to focus your time? Where, where are the opportunities in the near term to really make structural change? Um, if you look at this historically in the 1950s, you know, transportation policy, uh, was really all about speed. You know, how fast can you move? Doesn't matter where you're going, but anything you were doing was all about speed. You know, we're at this inflection point now where we can really move our transportation policy towards equity, towards climate, and towards economic development. You know, now is the time, and IDOT's opening up this new tool is really going to cement what are those priorities. And so focusing on those and making sure the right, the right criteria are being used and the right projects are being chosen is a, is a key focus that I would really encourage everyone uh, to engage in. It's open for public comment and there will be uh, efforts to improve and refine this over time and you guys should have a front row seat uh, at that discussion. And the second is on the federal side. You know, the federal money Jackie mentioned, uh, almost all of that is gonna flow through the state or the state will have some meaningful role in. And unique in this federal bill is how much competitive funding there is that's out there. Uh, this is five to six times more competitive dollars that'll be available through this federal infrastructure bill than, than any federal transportation bill in the last 35 years. And so what projects will the state prioritize and local communities prioritize? Uh, this is an opportunity and a threat. Uh, we could be chasing projects that are uh, destructive to the environment and do not have real benefits uh, to economic development, climate, or equity, or we could be prioritizing those projects that do so. Uh, this is where I think stakeholders and your groups uh, can be very, very helpful. And the decisions that'll be made uh, now will have a lasting, um, lasting impact for the next several decades. Um, so those are just three main points. The transportation and the state's role is enormous that the time uh, for change and the opportunity is really unique. It's, it's singular. We haven't really experienced this before. And uh, you know, some, some near-term ideas where to focus your attention is both here on this new bill and how it's implemented, and when the federal bill becomes available, how that's implemented as well. Thanks.
Danny, I think you're muted. So I'll be happy to say Mayor Chris Coos, one of my favorite mayors in the entire state of Illinois is up next. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm gonna be very broad brush today. I've, I've got a lot to cover and not a lot of time and I'm looking forward to your questions. You know, a lot of um, uh, what we're doing is uh, in our comprehensive plan that we just updated and, they, and the short phrase for that plan is called complete, compact and connected. And complete is a, a referencing that we are a welcoming community and we welcome people of all types and, uh, to the community and, and let them know that they are welcome here. Compact has to do with our physical planning, keeping our footprint small, uh, we feel that that's a very, very important uh, uh, strategy, and we've been doing it for years. And Connected has more to do with uh, smart cities technologies, embracing that, and, and moving on. So Bloomington in normal is about 125,000 people. We're 53,000 in normal. Bloomington's about 78,000. And we have some challenges like a lot of Midwestern communities have in the sense um, uh, that we... Uh, have no physical boundaries on three sides of our community. It's nothing but corn and soybean fields, uh, which makes it easy to, to sprawl and makes it very easy to sprawl. Um, our building types and neighborhoods really haven't changed since the late 1950s, early 1960s. And this has been uh, detrimental for, for alternative transportation modes in our community. Uh, this, I'd say second, sometimes third generation families are, are building our residential uh, housing in, in this community, and they've got a formula and they're, they're really, really hard to get off that formula. Uh, we have, through our zoning, um, um, really held back on, on expansions and, and new subdivisions, uh, a recession and uh, COVID kind of helped with that. Um, but um, we've got some things coming up that is going to put some pressure on that, so we have to be um, ready for it. Our third challenge, and, and no disrespect to my neighboring city, but they don't share the same values in terms of sprawl, uh, and that that's going to be an effect in our in our region. That uh, hopefully that they will they'll wake up and uh, uh, some of the things we're talking about today in terms of uh, uh, investments from the state and federal government will, will guide them on a better path. So our strategies have, have had a lot to do with our built environment. We have um, tried to keep our community compact. Um, we had a fair amount of, uh, of land available for residential housing, and we're really pushing people uh, to that. Uh, we have a, a significant uh, uh, trail system, bike pedestrian trail system in our community. We've been working on that for about 30 years and uh, it's really the envy of the mid, uh, Midwest. We currently have 53 miles of paved, uh, not at grade uh, uh, bike pedestrian trail system through the community. It's, it's hugely popular uh, for recreation and for transportation. Um, we have a, a bike pedestrian plan that we just updated. Uh, we are, by the way, a, a, a bronze level bike, bike friendly community. Um, and we're very proud of that. Uh, but our, our trail system is what I'd call a spine, uh, north, south and east, west. And so we're, we're finding routes within the community to connect. Um, so people have, have the ability to get wherever they want to in the community by, by cycling or walking, if, if that's their choice. Uh, our bus system has grown robustly in the community and we're, uh, we're working very hard to, uh, to continue with that. Uh, our system about five years ago was named uh, best small system in North America by the American uh, Public Transit Association. Um, I could talk a lot about that system, uh, but what we're seeing um, uh, coming out of COVID and, and actually going into COVID, uh, we were seeing a rise in choice riders and, and that's a good indication. Um, obviously we're on the Chicago St. Louis uh, uh, Amtrak corridor and uh, Amtrak riding uh, ridership here recently in the last couple of weeks has been pretty robust. 
we're, we're very happy about that to see that come back as strong as it has. We also did a program uh, in coordination with Mitsubishi when they were here and, and it kind of went idle for a while, but um, we're working with Rivian Automotive, which is a EV manufacturer located in Normal. Uh, it's called EV Town and it was a marketing entity to uh, encourage electric vehicle use in our community. Uh, and we've been pretty successful with that. Um, we have about 43 charging stations in our community, which I think is, you know, uh, kind of forward thinking in terms of what, uh, what we're finding for other communities. And we were also, uh, because of our location and uh, our EV town efforts, we had the first Tesla charging station in the Midwestern United States. Um, they, they've kind of noticed that. Now we're coming up on some challenges as a community. Uh, I mentioned Rivian uh, uh, Automotive, which is uh, an electric vehicle manufacturer. Um, they've done about a $5 billion investment in our community and in their factory. And there's a tertiary manufacturer that we're shortlisted with um, that wants, is looking to build a $7 billion um, uh, factory in, in the community. And that amounts to about seven to 8,000 jobs in our community. Um, we're not unlike other communities that housing is, is strongly in demand. Uh, anything that goes on the market in this community, if it stays on more than 48 hours, that's, that's a surprise. And we're very aware that if uh, uh, the second manufacturer comes in, we're going to have a serious problem in terms of providing housing. And part of that challenge is we're hearing um, uh, from, the, from the people at Rivian that are coming in, is they want a different type of housing than we have available. Now, there are certainly people that want single family detached housing because they, they have families in that, but there are a lot of people that don't. And they, they want uh, uh, multifamily housing, whether it be apartments or condominiums. Uh, and they want uh, access to uh, uh, transit. They want access to trail systems. They want to be able to ride their bikes to work. We're hearing quite a bit about that. Um, I've gone over my time, so I'm looking forward to your questions, but uh, we think we've done a lot in our community, but we've got a lot more to do. Well, thank, thank you so much for giving us some insight on what you all have done in Normal, and honestly, you guys are definitely ahead of the curve on a lot of these things, um, and as um, Tom was saying earlier, there is a lot that the environmental community can do to help um, advocate and push for things um, in, in transportation sector that, you know, um, Normal Illinois has already stepped forward and have uh, really um, kind of led the charge here in the Midwest and a lot of our communities. I know I've seen some sustainability um, coordinators uh, here on the call, some folks from different um, municipalities. And I think as we're looking at uh, the future, um, it's going to be at all layers, uh, municipal, state, and federal, that we're going to have to continue advocating for. Um, and on that note, on the state side, um, I do want to turn it over to Audrey Wenink to give us a little bit of insight on what other states are currently doing that could uh, potentially be replicated here in the state of Illinois. Yes. Um, hi. Thank you so much for having me as part of this panel. I'm very excited to talk about this important topic and so excited about the energy that the environmental community has uh, ramped up with transportation. There's so much potential there. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few different concepts um, that are going on in other states to help people see kind of what the lay of the land is, what's possible. Um, get inspired uh, and understand kind of the different types of things states are doing. So um, there are a couple states that have state level commute trip reduction programs. Uh, Washington was the first adopting a law in uh, 1991 as part of its state clear and clean air act with the intent to reduce automobile related air pollution congestion and reduce energy use through employer based programs. Um, and so that um, what that looks like is typically a, a business has conducts a survey of its employees in terms of what modes they're using, uh, develops uh, reports on those, maintains employee transportation coordinators, um, and 
uh, subsidizes and promotes uh, non auto travel for commutes. Um, Oregon does that too. Uh, employers must provide commute options that have the potential to reduce auto trips by 10%. So those are just a couple of examples. And we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> <clears throat> and there's been some uh, notes in the chat about VM, VM, vehicle mile travel reduction. I'm glad everyone's thinking that in that direction. Um, there are a couple states that have set statewide targets for reduction. Uh, there's some interesting stuff going on just north of us in Minnesota. Um, that state uh, developed the report you see on the slide called Pathways to Decarbonizing Transportation um, as part of as a follow-up to that, they established a sustainable transportation advisory council. Um, and that council made a number of recommendations, one of which was establishing a target of vehicle miles traveled reduction. This is their 20% uh, is their preliminary goal. Um, and they also committed to prioritizing other solutions before considering highway expansion. We also see that in Washington, they also established a target VMT reduction per capita. Uh, for last year, uh, and then they have an uh, interim target. So this is something that states are starting to do. It's still relatively new, um, but it's particularly intriguing how uh, at a state level transportation advisory, sustainable transportation advisory council was developed in one state and made a suite of recommendations, a number of which they are uh, taking, uh, implementing. We can go to the next slide. Uh, in California, they um, developed a climate action plan for transportation infrastructure. This is this is brand new. It was published in July of this year. And the plan is intended to detail how the state should invest billions of discretionary transportation dollars to aggressively combat and adapt to climate change while supporting public health, safety, and equity. And this builds on executive orders signed by their governor in 2019 and 2020 targeted at reducing GHG emissions, which account in California for more than 40% of all emissions. Uh, nationally, it's a little lower than that, but they, they're even worse because they drive so much. Um, and so these are, these are a couple other uh, items that are in the plan, uh, ways to mitigate increases in VMT, um, a working group to explore pricing strategies. You know, when you make driving more expensive, people drive less. So these are a couple strategies, and then you you develop revenue sources that can be put towards sustainable transportation. Um, and then also they understand the the relationship, um, as Mayor Coos just described, the relationship between land use policies and transportation and streamlining development for space efficient housing that will. Uh, allow for better uh, biking and walking and transit use. So we can go to the next slide. Um, another thing that they did in California that is very intriguing, this happened about seven or eight years ago and was really a big deal in the transportation planning uh, community is that um, historically, a measure that has been used uh, in transportation has been level of service which basically is a, a measure of how many, you know, how many cars are going through an intersection and how congested the roads are and, and look. Um, and so every time you would have a level of service that was bad, then many times the solution was believed to be increasing the uh, size of the road. And then that was creating induced demand as, as, um, as Danny showed in some of the slides earlier. So now um, they have required environmental impacts of development to be measured in terms of vehicle miles traveled. So total auto travel. And that is, that is a much better indication of, uh, of impact. And there have been a couple of recent studies in California that show that this change is actually reducing costs for developers and streamlining the review of, of projects. So there are other uh, co-benefits for this. And then we can go to the next slide. Um, transportation coordination with land use. So at the state level in Virginia, um, this state requires comprehensive planning um, by every community in the state. And there is then state level discretionary funds that can support more sustainable practices. Um, of particular note right now is uh, 
Virginia has a statewide plan that uses performance-based planning. Smart scale is the image there. That's a model that we have looked at and um, are, are drawing uh, knowledge and inspiration from as we refine our uh, tool that, that Tom Katar uh, was describing earlier. Um, and they actually, as one of their criteria in their smart scale, they actually uh, reference some of the land use work that they're doing. So they're trying to connect their state level transportation investments to land use policies, um, which, is, which is a very, um, very strong approach. And then one uh, next slide, the last slide that, that I have is um, focusing on transit oriented development. So New Jersey has a state level program that designates municipalities as transit villages. And this is when uh, you may have you may have heard of TOD, uh, and this is when a community is committing to uh, developing in a transit oriented way, um, compact, just like Mayor Coos was saying, uh, mixed use neighborhoods, uh, and then there's a whole transit village task force at the state level that designates these communities, and the benefit for the communities is they can get priority funding and technical assistance and have increased coordination among state agencies. Um, so this is another uh, model approach uh, to support transit um, and walkable communities uh, in efficient land use. So I will stop there. Um, hope you feel inspired and we can, uh, we can take your, oh, you know, one thing I just wanna answer really quickly. I saw in the chat, there was the, the question about, um, you know, wouldn't it great, be great if uh, VMT was a goal uh, for transportation planners? Um, I will mention that in the tool that was just launched on Friday, um, the change in annual vehicle miles traveled is one of the criteria that was proposed by um, Illinois DOT, which is really uh, great. So we obviously would hope to see that number go down, <laughs> um, that projects you know, would be prioritized that are reducing um, VMT. So um, keep an eye on that. And, and that's something that you guys from the environmental community can comment on, you know, make sure that pri prioritizing projects occurs in terms of the scale of VMT reduction. Um, so just wanted to make a note of that. And I will wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with that, uh, Audrey answering um, questions from, from the chat, uh, welcome anyone who has questions uh, to either put them in the chat. Um, you guys could also use the raise your hand button um, to uh, go ahead and um, ask a question and we can make sure that you come off mute. I do have one er earlier in the chat um, that I would love to put out there coming from Geraldine Conrad. Um, she mentions that she knows that Biden is on record against a race in fuel tax, but do you see this happening in the next several years? Um, so um, we'd definitely love to turn it over to our panelists to give us some insight on how they think that the fuel tax um, could either impact, but also would, would this be something that could be on the line in the next few years? That's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, yeah, with this um, really increase in federal funding that will come out of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, you know, the highway trust fund as, as currently constructed um, that, you know, we pay taxes for gasoline, we pay taxes for tires. Um, um, let's see, there are four major things and I can't remember the other two. But, um, you know, the, the, the Highway Trust Fund has not provided enough funds for the, the, the FAST Act or uh, the, the MAP Act before, uh, Act before that, that transportation has been funded partially out of the general revenue. So, um, so somehow or another, we'll have to fund this huge package. Now, you know, they're talking about things like uh, capturing some of uh, increasing taxes on the on the very wealthy uh, um, as one source, uh, you know, taking advantage of 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 capturing some of the excess uh, of funding ability that's been provided for other funds, other programs. Uh, whether or not that's enough to fund this package, you know, we'll have to wait and see what uh, what comes out of it. But right now, I think as long as the president is against the uh, gasoline tax, we probably will not get it, uh, increase in gasoline tax. But, you know, never say never. 
I don't know, but uh, Tom, what are your thoughts on that? I think you're right, Jackie, on the federal side. And you know, a point to Danny's slide about the energy bill having a study about transportation funding and financing. Um, you know, long term, this isn't going to happen in the next couple of years. The motor fuel tax is going to wane in purchasing power because of the more efficient vehicles that are out there. You know, I think the current status quo, and we saw this in the capital bill, was to price electric vehicles in a way that was you know, somewhat aggressive. You know, the mindset being, you know, they don't pay their fair share, so let's let's tax that. You know, I think that's a somewhat myopic view, and we really need to broaden that lens much much broader about how do we fund and finance transportation. In many ways, the way that our coalition approached looking at what are we investing in and why, we need to bring that same sort of critical um, approach to how are we funding transportation and where is the sort of funding going. And right now, we are still using very antiquated formulas of dollars going to a motor, you know, a, a road fund that is primarily just for roads, construction account that just builds roads where our transportation system and the needs of people, businesses, users are much more intermodal, multimodal, and should have goals like reducing um, VMT, et cetera, baked into it. We don't do that now. The, the time for those types of questions and policies uh, really are right now. Perfect. Thank you both for uh, providing uh, good context on that question. Um, another question that came in the chat is, um, and maybe I can turn this over to Mayor Kuz and Tom. How can the state do more to support municipalities um, and the work that is happening, like um, is happening in normal Illinois? Tom, you want to take first shot? Sure. I, from again, from a structural standpoint, we're still operating under you know municipalities getting a sliver of state motor fuel tax you know those percentages those types of funding flows even the eligibility for those funds the eligibility is very rigid they're old they're, they they have not really been revisited in a long time uh, you know there's been a minor change but it's significant you know the state for the longest time would make local municipalities pay for sidewalks on state road, you know, state projects funded uh, in their communities. And now that's changed due to legislation um, where, you know, sidewalks will be more, you know, incorporated uh, in something that's not really penalized and, and, you know, sort of the burden put on municipalities. A, a policy that looks at those fundings with much more flexibility and given to mayors like Mayor Coos to achieve the goals that he has. They have a great plan. You know, the, the planning that's happening in normal over the last two, three decades or you know, 20 years has been excellent. They should have funding from the state DOT to accomplish those, not in a very siloed way that says you can only use it for this and this. And that's, a, that's the current situation today. I will add that uh, it's, it's a priority for US Conference of Mayors uh, working with the federal government to get some kind of hybrid distribution form going where some dollars you know, the state obviously has to have dollars flow uh, into their uh, DOTs, but have have dollars flow directly to communities uh, so that they uh, they can do the projects that are important to their community instead of uh, having, a, as Tom said, a broad brush of rules that uh, fit everybody, but actually hardly fit anybody in when, when the rubber hits the road in the municipal level. Um, so that's that's an issue that could make a huge difference. And there has been research to say, and, and no criticism of IDOT on this, um, but there are, there are projects that can be done uh, uh, much more efficiently in terms of dollar use if, if those dollars come directly. Perfect. Thank you both. Um, I do have two more questions in the chat um, that I would love to answer before we wrap up. Um, and Audrey, maybe you can help us with this next one. How are vehicle miles travel determined? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the DOT does traffic counts. So they actually have like cameras that count um, traffic. Uh, so they have data sources um, in terms of the number of cars, the number of trucks that are going on roads. I think um, for the case of uh, proposed projects, 
and their future impact on vehicle miles traveled, they will use uh, some type of uh, travel demand model. Um, and it, we have that at the regional level. Uh, our Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Plan Planning uses a travel demand model, and the state will use some type of um, you know forecasting method that will look at how much uh, VMT will change uh, if a project is developed. Um, but we have to we have to ask the right questions too about those tools. You know, will will induced demand be included in those in those tools? Perfect. Um, and then the final question that we have, um, is there research that indicates increasing the number of public EV charging stations in a community will result in increased EV registration among residents? Um, do any of y'all have any um, research on, on that topic? I'll, I'll jump in and say not, no research, but certainly from observations. Um, uh, the CEO of uh, Rivian, um, uh, made the analogy uh, when when the Model T first started being mass produced, uh, there were very few gas stations in the United States, and within three years there were thousands of gas stations. Um, so, uh, a big issue for EV technology is what they call uh, range anxiety, that people are uh, un uncertain about. Um, uh, being able to travel and, and charge their vehicles. And we're seeing that change. Um, um, I have, uh, we have a lot of private uh, companies like supermarkets and that that are putting charging stations in. And I can just tell you when we put those in, the, the sales of EVs or the leasing of EVs in our community uh, took off. Uh, you know, not in astronomical numbers, obviously, but certainly more, um, um, more usage and, and, and more embracing of that technology. And our charging infrastructure, I think, had a lot to do with that. Um, also, the Tesla supercharger station is in uh, my city hall deck. And I, I can tell you, I see 10 to 12 unique Teslas every day coming in and plates from all over the country. So um, that charging infrastructure is key uh, for people to embrace uh, uh, EV technology. Having said that, I, I will tell you, at least in a suburban model, that uh, most of the EV charging is going on at the home. Uh, it's not that expensive to put a charging station, a uh, charging unit in your in your garage, and, and at least in a suburban setting, that's what we're seeing. People that embrace an uh, electric vehicle are charging at home. Perfect. Thank you so much for giving us some of that insight. Um, so, you know, as as uh, Major Coos uh, mentioned, it's it's one of those. Cash me to you know, the more EV infrastructure we put in place, more incentivizes, but also the more people buy those cars, the more we can put uh, EV infrastructure. So there's a lot um, to to those projects coming up. Um, and um, some of the next steps that I encourage you all, um, if you have questions or ideas, feel free to email me. If you aren't part of our um, our uh, affiliate group, but would like to get more information, feel free to reach out. Um, we do have some upcoming um, events that would love to encourage folks to be at. Um, we are going to have um, uh, an upcoming transportation legislative call um, to talk about priorities um, that we'd like to see in next uh, sessions. Uh, General Assembly at the state level. So October 1st is when that will happen. And if you would like to uh, learn a little bit more about how to participate in that, feel free to email me and um, we can have that discussion on how to uh, bring you on into our space. Um, also uh, pitching a few of our affiliate events that are uh, related to transportation. Um, our friends at Equid City are having a series of peace bike rides in Chicago uh, to talk a little bit about um, bike safety and also uh, implementing safer streets, September 18th, September 25th, and October 2nd throughout the city. Um, I can uh, send out a follow-up email to give you all some more information on uh, where and when uh, those uh, 
bike rides will be uh, taking place. And our friends from Workhouse Workers for Justice are also going to be um, having an event uh, out in Joliet called Charged Up, where they're going to be discussing uh, the current uh, new line uh, electric facility that is being um, developed out in their community and how we can also push for uh, fair and equitable jobs um, at these facilities and procurement for um, uh, municipalities across the state. Um, so that will be October 2nd. So once again, I want to thank you all for taking some time um, to spend your lunches with us. Um, and I want to thank our panelists for their time and expertise in giving us this insight. And there is a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that we are reducing greenhouse emissions through the transportation sector. Um, so definitely encourage you all to stay connected to IAC and transportation as we continue growing this uh, work and making sure that we uh, amplify uh, the voice of transportation advocates with each other and um, use our power together to uh, bring the changes we need to get us to um, cleaner and safer environment. So thank you all for your time and hope you all have a great rest of your um, afternoon.